I can't do a podcast when it's not a Friday. Sippers, welcome to this episode of the Tea With Me podcast with me, your wee mate Shane Todd. Very excited about this episode. Before we kick into it, let me plug a few things very quickly. Number one, it's Patreon. Patreon.com slash Tea With Me podcast. In a few weeks, hopefully, we'll put our live episode from the Waterfront Hall on there. 2,000 people, 2,000 sippers having tea with us. Me, Kieran Bartlett, Dave Elliott. There was a music surprise at the end. 2,000 people with their phones up. It was like a friggin' Coldplay concert. Some most A lot of people hear Coldplay. That's not a good advertisement for it. It was like a great concert. An unbelievable night. And honestly, I think watching it, you'll get a sense of just how good it was. I know a lot of people weren't able to make it. This is the next best thing. Like everything we do, it's on Patreon first. I've got a vlog up there from a recent tour show. I've got quite a few more to put out as well. And before they go anywhere, they go to Patreon. We're going to do something very cool when we hit 2,000 patrons. For 1,000, the tattoos are coming. I'm going to give you Willie G's number. It's going to be easy. It's going to be easier. It's going to be easier. Yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Um, because you do, do arranging and all. Um, I, I'm not good at that. Um, so patreon.com slash TV podcast. We do a bonus episode on a Monday, live stream episode on a Friday, every week. Every week. Some, you, you, you regularly, every week. We don't miss episodes. Damn, that screen's gone off, man. Um, before we get stuck into this, we are sponsored by, first of all, NordVPN. What does that mean? Very peculiar nanny? No, virtual private network. It's a service that protects your internet connection and privacy online. It creates an encrypted tunnel, and you know I love tunnels for your data. Protects your online identity by hiding your IP address. Where, where's your IP address? Shh, hidden. It allows you to use public Wi-Fi spots safely. It's very easy to use. It's quick. You can use it with all the big platforms. Windows, Android, iOS. Even your Android TV supports NordVPN. You can access from anywhere. So you don't miss your favourite content when you're abroad. What about if you're in Mozambique and you want to watch... Get my headpiece? You can do it with NordVPN. It's not going to say, no, you've got to be in the same country. NordVPN, hide your IP address. You can watch anime from Japan. You can watch cricket from Russia. <laughs> do they play it there? I don't know. Should you be support? I, I don't know anything. All I know is NordVPN have an exclusive deal with us. You go to nordvpn.com slash tea with me. We'll put everything in the description, by the way, of this episode. And you get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan, plus free threat protection and one additional month for free it's completely risk-free with nord's 30-day money back guarantee nord vpn we are also sponsored by manscaped the number one in men's below the belt grooming okay is it a taboo subject i don't know but i'm talking about your hair down there and back in the day people were using all sorts garden shears people pe- I know. I, I have heard in some cases where people were 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 you coaxing a ferret in in, in the doing the work for you down there, you know. But now, it, like with with some sort of miniature plow. But nowadays, you don't need to do any of that because Manscaped are here for you. They've got products like the Lawnmower Four Point which glide it glides about like a hot knife through butter. Gets rid of your hair down there, keeps it all nice and smooth. All right, guys, stop teeing. I see you there giggling. Let's get serious about this. These guys have ball cleanser, ball deodorant, ball wipes. All of it. They take care of your family jewels. They have the perfect performance package. They've got bundles, cologne, boxers. Name something, Dan. I have it. Name something. A weed whacker for your nose and ear hair. What are they going to think of next? These guys have pubes on the brain. Manscaped.com. Use the code T with me for 20% off and free shipping. We appreciate their support and all our sponsors' support as always. Now, it's time to get into this episode. Here's how this came about. A couple of weeks ago, I got an email through my website, shantalkcomedy.net, probably. Um, and the name on it was Roy Walker. And it was just a short message to say, like, just discovered your stuff, keep it up, basically. And I... I had to try and figure out if it was the Roy Walker, as in catchphrase Roy Walker, as in comedy legend Roy Walker, 
car park catchphrase legend Roy Walker and it turns out it was so I emailed a little bit back and forth to Roy told him how much I appreciated him who I've grown up watching a genuine legend of not just comedy here but he's toured all over the world as you find out in the episode he's played with literally the biggest names in showbiz in the biggest venues and he's as sharp now as he always was guys on stage absolutely destroying rooms still so I I Asked Roy if he would come on the podcast, and it turned out the week after we were messaging, he was going to be home for an afternoon because uh, he's he's doing uh, a little bit of cruise ship stand up at the minute. Just gen- genuinely, just living the dream, just living the dream. And I sent a message and said, "Look, we'd love to have you on." We arranged it, and a few a few days after chatting, he's here. Just did the episode, and honestly, I could have spoken to him for days. I had a plan in my head, a very rough plan, like I do with all these episodes of, I'll oh, maybe ask him about this and that and that. I asked him 10% of what I wanted to ask him because we were just in conversation, hanging on his every word. He's honestly he's been there and done it. This guy was coming up in the 70s. In the 70s, like playing venues that just aren't there anymore that people wouldn't have heard of. And he's just consistently been funny and part of what what he talked about was he's just been him he's like i just do what i do he's not he's not had to felt the need to change his style he's not trying to f- lean into trends his attitude is he just gets up there and does his jokes and jesus christ he does it well uh i was honestly at times in this episode dying laughing and there was uh one or two moments in this podcast where I, I was trying not to get very, very emotional because it's something I explained to Mike before we recorded. It's a bit like when I went to see the Rolling Stones in Crow Park a couple of years ago. I'm like, they were performing in the 60s, late 60s, probably 70s, and it's 2022, and they're here, and we're watching them, and they're performing, and it's exactly the same sitting with Roy. You know, someone who, you know, is absolutely a household name and and it is so beloved, you know, it's just just a genuinely, genuinely lovely guy who's very good at what he does. Um, we touched on the troubles just a little bit because it was important because that shaped a big turning point in his, his life and his career and he was talking about an experience he had with his family during that and... I don't know if you'll be able to see in the episode, but I'm nearly gone. Um, but Roy's so funny that probably a minute later um, I was laughing my leg off. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy this episode of the Tea With Me podcast with honestly the, the living legend, the one and only Roy Walker. It's good, and it is right. Roy, I always ask guests when they come on as my first question about your tea drinking. Are you a tea drinker? How much tea do you drink? What's your relationship with tea? Well, I like tea, and uh, I drink tea. I don't get coffee at all, yeah. except in America. And when I go to America, I always say to my friend, when I get there, I'm not eating any of that rubbish food that they have. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just do not get hot dogs <laughs> and, uh, what do you call it, have pizza, you? <laughs> and I don't get uh, burgers, <laughs> and uh, I definitely will not drink their coffee. Yeah. I'm only there two days. So I'm, will you bring I'm a piece? at all. Will you bring a piece if you go to America? Yeah, own? <laughs> I just can't. It, it tastes lovely, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, the coffee, black coffee, yeah. and it ruins your teeth like, but I yeah. I quite like it. And it all, no matter where you go, it always tastes the same. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, because they, they just fill it up all day. It's yeah. the same kind of thing. The thing I don't like about coffee is, it, coffee in Starbucks and things like that is a pudding. Yeah. No, but. Big frothy cream yeah, on it. Yeah. If I want a coffee, I want it to taste like. My granny used to drink Camp Coffee. Was that a brand? It was a brand, yeah, with a kilty on the front of it. Right. A lo- um, was it a local brand or? Uh, yeah. And, well, I don't know. She bought it in Lipton's. Right. And like because that's the only thing that she could afford in Lipton's, and she thought she was the bee's knees. Yeah. <laughs> walking in and out of Lipton, Lipton's. Was that a shop in Belfast? Yeah, and they had Lipton's tea as well. Was a fancy, it was a fancy shop? Oh, yeah. It was like an upmarket sort of shop. Would it, so like a modern Marks and Spencers? Very. Maybe even higher than Marks oh, and Spencers. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, Roy, there's so much I want to talk to you about, ask you about. Um, 
I, I've actually met you, but this isn't the first time we've met. Really? I met you many, you've forgotten. Um, I met you many years ago at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. And I was maybe, I mean, I'm talking more than 10 years ago. It's about, twel- about 12 years ago, yeah. Yeah, you were there with Phil? <coughs> you were there with your son, Phil? He he come up to see me just for the night. Yeah, yep, you were both walking up the, the, the mile. And I was flyering for my show that nobody ever nobody ever came to. And we saw you. I was there with a couple other local comedians, and we saw you. And well, you know, you you say hello. To, no, you say hello to what, what I remember a meeting a load of Irish comedians. You know, yeah, asking them where they were. Were they a group of you? There was a group yeah. of us. Yeah, and I had, I I decided the best because you know what Edinburgh's like. It's it's hills. It's you got to walk everywhere. So I bought a a scooter, just a wee just a wee push scooter, and we started talking if to only you. You had a kept a patent. <laughs> You took a real interest in my scooter. So we started talking to you, and uh, and my scooter was broken at the time. And we were asking you, oh, what show were you doing? And you picked up my scooter, and I said, oh, it's, it's broken. And you must have spent, you were talking away to us for five, ten minutes, and you spent a long time trying to just, as we were chatting, fix my scooter. And for some reason, I'll never forget that. Either. It was the most surreal, just that we were talking to you. And then also, I was just, like, I was, just took a look back, and I thought... Roy Walker's trying to fix my scooter. No, you didn't fix it, but you gave it a good go. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> the funny thing about that is the feeling that I had when I was there, uh, Shane, was unbelievable. Um, it was completely all new to me, and I was there not to show everybody uh, I can compete with this, that, and the other thing. That might have been in the back of my mind at some days, but what I was really there for was, I was there as a student to find out what it was all about. Because when you work as a stand-up all the time, and I am probably the hardest working stand-up comic you'll ever meet, there's no time to see others. There's no time to compare. There's no time to discuss. Yep. I went there, it was like university yeah, to me. Yeah. And the guys flying in the street. Um, Philip went uh, a year or so later, or maybe he was there. Yeah, I think I think he was he there. Was there I think he was there. So I was flying with him, yeah. handing them out. Yeah. And of course put the it seemed like a good idea, Dad helping the son. <laughs> yeah. But everybody was saying, "Are you on? If you're on, we'll go." Yeah, it would be okay no. if my dad flyed yeah. with me, because <laughs> yeah. no one's coming to see my dad do a show. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, I remember there was a load of people around you, and and we just thought it was great that we had a proper. Ch- and you were asking us about our show, and I thought I thought that was great. Well, um, I'd been, I'd been that before that. Yeah. Uh, to do my show and what have you, and to tell you the truth, I just did that well. Uh, that I couldn't repeat it. I couldn't go back. Right. Um, what, what year were you at the Edinburgh Friends the first time? About 12 years ago. Okay. I only did it the once. Oh, okay. So you weren't like at the start of it or, or really no. in your early career you, you weren't no. up there? No. And uh, I, I, I set it up myself. I met, um, I met um, uh, someone that would put me on a producer and what have you. And I, was gonna, I wasn't going to go into bad digs or something. I really got a nice flat down late. And um, he, he gave me a nice room uh, at the ballroom. Mm-hmm. And um, I was very nervous because it was not long after catchphrase. And I was thinking, um, oh, I hope it's not ca- catchphrase f- uh, fans, you know, yes. coming along, hoping to play catchphrase all night or something like that. There. I, right. wanted, I wanted to establish myself because the same thing happened to Bob Monkhouse. Is when you take a game show, your comedic fame leaves you. I think it happened to Patrick as well a bit. You know, you have to go out and establish yourself again and do tours, meet the public. Yeah, and, and maybe people that don't know think when they see... If you host a game show and then people see you're doing stand-up, maybe they think you've now just decided to get into stand-up, not realising you've been doing it for so long before. Very good point, yeah. Right. So anyway, uh, off I go. And the first two nights, Shane, it was catchphrase audience, lovely old dears, you know. What if I let myself in for? <laughs> and I was. It rains in Edinburgh every day at the French. Be seeing four umbrellas. Yeah, in four weeks. Right, four umbrellas. So, 
Would they when you when you're saying catchphrase fans, will they is it that they're shouting things out or is it you can just tell by looking at them you say you know, they're here for they're not here for the stand up. Yeah. 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 So uh I was so downhearted and uh I had a really, really good uh, backstage team and uh, I was on the beautiful room, the ballroom. Was a, and Count Arthur Strong was on, he's in the next... Yeah, he's great. I mean, I don't know, you know what stalls are like for racehorses, <laughs> but that's what the dressing rooms are like. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Like yeah. They set out with canvas. There's no glamour at the, no at, glamour at the end of the fringe. Which I quite, I quite like. It was, uh, right. it was just like student yes, accommodation yeah, yeah. type of thing. Uh, and they came to the opening night. I was so crestfallen and what I did, <laughs> downhearted. And I went to the stage manager and I said to her, anybody in? And she went, you're kidding. And I didn't know whether she meant it was the same as last night. You yeah. Know? So on I went, came out, the place was bunged. Yeah. No old people in sight, <laughs> all young people. Yeah. Right, an awful lot of them catchphrase fans, by yes. the way, as well. So I got started into it and what have you, and then at the end, um, I I did uh, five minutes of catchphrase, showed them the snake charmer or something, like that. <laughs> and uh, I was very lucky enough to be on Chris Moyes for nine years. Yeah, uh, we, we went for a, a month and stayed nine years. Yeah. And that was the best fun I've ever had with Comedy Dave, you know? That was... Um, that was real laugh out loud radio. That was radio that you didn't. I I I don't listen to radio nowadays. Really, I right. listen to Spotify or just music or podcasts, obviously. But that was a time when when you you didn't want to miss that segment. Well, it's just it's the last ten minutes of the show. Yeah, and he never knew what I was going to say. They were all plotting yeah. behind him to catch him out. But he never caught out once. Yeah, and of course. After a couple, we played car park catchphrase, and after a, a couple of months of doing that, Comedy Dave went, I could invent a character here. So he invented me as this man, in his, uh, then I was in my 70s, and uh, who uh, is going out with very young, attractive women, <laughs> and he's a great songwriter, and he's friends with Madonna, right, yeah. and he's written a few of her hits and all that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the, van, the white van man, yeah. everybody driving around at that time, it was a, a 10 minute relief to them. Yeah, it was. And the, and the other one was, is, is, uh, we had to come on once at Christmas or something like that there, and, and Chris had to guess who you were. So I talk like that, so I did go way up high. <laughs> and, what happened, and he couldn't guess who <laughs> right. it was, it was infuriating him. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, they, they, Dave says to me, why don't you sing like that, Roy? So, like a virgin being touched for the very first time, you know? If you gave me a million pounds and asked me who that was that they sang about, <laughs> you know, and it just came out of me, and I didn't even know the songs, to right. tell you the truth. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even know who Madonna was. I thought she was in the Bible or something. But I mean, uh, So, uh, the, the, uh, Chris's uh, producer would come out, and she would sing the line to me. And, uh, and I would back. repeat it, you right? Know, and it worked. Yeah, <clears throat> and it was great fun. Yeah. So off, got a whole new sort of audience out of that. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, and I remember at that time, everybody. I remember a time when I was going to college. Everybody's text message tone on their phone was the the catch the catchphrase <laughs> noise. What the beyond? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Was that you doing that, Roy, <laughs> on the show, <laughs> just no, with your own no, boys? No, it was, uh, <laughs> no, it was, it was, it was iconic uh, time. I was very lucky to get that. <laughs> yeah, we really are. Well, let me. I mean, <laughs> I, I want to go. I want to. So, I want to go back first of all. Um, I remember seeing a a documentary you made years ago um, about about Belfast, about your relationship with Belfast and and, and growing up here. Um, also, I got to say, I, I've seen you live before. I saw you. At the Opera House, years ago, maybe. Well, maybe that, that 10? was immediately 10 after years. Edinburgh. Oh right, okay. I did a tour. Oh, so the show you had at Edinburgh, yeah. you then yeah. toured. So that was the sort of a supposed to be the highlight of my career was to star uh, on my own show at the Opera House. Right. Yeah. What a what a venue! I I remember the time I wasn't that long into stand up. Um, I had been doing I've been doing stand up for maybe four or five years. And um, a load of mates were going to the show, 
and and they said you want to go along I said okay and and I think I had no idea of what of what I thought it would be like because this was a period where everybody was trying to be edgy with stand up and I and I, I was trying to do that as well on stage and it was there was so many young people like me getting into stand up and I knew you from catchphrase and I knew you were a comedian but I didn't know what that show would yeah, be like yeah. and I just remember from start to finish just having such a great time I remember that the setups of the one liners were getting a bigger laugh than most people's punchline right, right. you know not the bit yeah. not not the punch just your setup yeah. and and just the atmosphere it was just it was almost like a because you were talking about I guess the old Belfast and maybe the likes of the shipyard yeah and I'd, I would have a lot of family working in the shipyard so yeah. I'd heard stories over the year and I remember just I remember looking at the venue at the time when you were on and thinking this is just such a great experience to be here and see this and even the fact you were wearing a suit you know that's that's not done really anymore and it's 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 a shame in a way well it has to be you you know yeah so, yeah uh, it depends which team you play for which colors you wear yeah yeah uh, so today i i don't really get it i see paul mccartney come out with a lovely three thousand pound suit and trainers and you mm -hmm. go have you not got some nice brogues <laughs> You know, uh, you know, I, I, I'm wearing brogues today, yeah. you know, and I think, yeah, I can afford them. Yeah. But I bet you couldn't guess the age of them. They're 25 year old. Okay. So if you buy a decent pair of shoes, they last. Well, you, do you? you? Know. But it's wonderful what you say out there because my eldest boy, Mark, has left comedy. He's 57 now and he's left comedy, he's sailing around the world. He's saved his money up uh, on his own. And uh, I said, what did you leave for, Mark? You were so good at it. And he went, I'm not saying anything, Daddy. Right. Which is what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So I've never really said anything. I, I've just uh, I've got a nice style. It's just... But there's no meaning, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and, and, and I don't like the comedy, really, that... You know, uh, people can fall into a trap of it has to have a, a, a message, whether it's political or some well, Dave sort of... Dave Chappelle's his favourite at the moment. Right. And I said, but he's a black man. He's got... He's angry. Yeah. Of the way they're being treated and what have you. Yeah. Rightly so. Yeah. So he's, he's, he's putting it out there. Yeah. And uh, they're paying him big, big money for it. I said, but there's nothing wrong with you, do you know? You know yeah. You've had a lovely life. So well, funny is that's the thing. Funny is funny. Funny is funny, and a joke is. But but that was the that was the night being there and and looking round and seeing the opera house as well and just the way the stage was lit. That was a night where I I I thought I would someday love to play yeah. the opera house. Yeah. And, and and when I did it in the first show in August, I was thinking about that night watching you and just how. But it's how amazing great you was. saying that because I saw Laurel and Hardy. On the opera house. Oh, wow. Well. Right, in the 50s. Right. And I, I became a Stan Laurel and Ollie fan. I'm having, I just, the whole, and then when, I, I mean, I was I was with James Young then, who mm -hmm. was a Ulster comedian. Yeah, I've seen a lot of the old and archive the, the footage. Sound of the, the sound of the laughter. Yeah. It was like, it's better than a roar of football when you score. Yeah, yeah. You know, because they don't score all that often. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But j j line after line yep. after line, and and uh, and my mummy took me to see Chick Murray, and uh, he was so dry. And was he a comic? Yeah, he's Billy Connolly's uncle. That's where Billy Connolly gets it from. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he, it, it's amazing how I'm sure you've got. I told your audience about how you came. To to do it what got you up on the stage the first time mm -hmm. so i watched him and what happened is they were a double act him and the wife she played the accordion which lots of jewel jewels jewel, jewel singers did and she uh they sang country and western and he harmonized you know and then she would go off she was only only on 10 minutes right and she would go off and change her frock and come out without the accordion just to show off a lovely new frock or something. And right. he would, uh, he'd come forward to the microphone. Apparently he did it in Glasgow and the manager of the theatre spotted something and then he would just go, um, 
I was walking along the road and uh, it was as if he was like thinking about what can I say next and he, he wore a bonnet, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, there was, uh, I knew I was walking, the, the pavement was moving underneath my feet <laughs> and uh, a fellow came, uh, came towards me and he stopped, so I stopped just to show him I could do it. <laughs> 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 Shaney had me hooked. <laughs> he said, well, it's so Belfast, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, of course. You know, he said, um, where are you going? I said, I'm taking my dog to be put down. Is it mad? He said, it's no very pleased. <laughs> I'm like, I want to be you, mister. <laughs> mister, I want to be you. What age would you have been at this time? 14. Right. And then uh, I saw Ken Dodd. And like, Ken Dodd... Ken Dodd's a madman. He's yeah. a clown. Yeah. He never stopped being a clown. And and uh, he was a ventriloquist then, believe it or not. <laughs> right. With one diddy man. Right. You know, in his opening line, he came out, he, came out, he said, um, I'm I'm a diddy man, you know? And a, a fellow at the front said, me too. <laughs> 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 Belfast straight in there, you know? It's a terrific humour. <laughs> But go on, I mean, when you were, you were say you were 14, you were looking at uh, Chick Murray and these people and, and, and wanting to be them. Was it just wanting to be like a performer or did you think, did you think, I want to be a stand-up? No, no, no. I just wanted people to laugh at me. Right. Yeah. And uh, I, I was always wrapped up in my own thoughts. Uh, 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 people, people would say, were you a loner? Mm -hmm. You know? And um, no, I, no, I was. I knew where I was, and I can relate to being in my, be, feeling like I was in my own world a little bit, especially when I was in school. Well, it all changed one day in science. Um, the science teacher he was doing an, a lecture on an, the human eye, and uh, he said, "I haven't got an eye, right, to show you what it's made of, but." Have you any idea what it's made of? A uh, gristle, sir, a uh, muscle, no. Um, skin, no, no. Uh, glass, no, no. Uh, it's, it's actually made from water. And we went, <laughs> get out of here, <laughs> water, you know. He said, I can't prove it to you. Now, I always worked from I was at least 11. Uh, had all sorts of jobs, collecting waste paper, collecting skins, swill for pigs and what have you, uh, delivering newspapers, helping the milkman, uh, things like that. So I was a Belfast boy. Mm -hmm. I had been to places none of the people in the class had ever been. I had met Catholics. Yeah. They had never done that. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, uh, so I'd, I'd heard banter yeah. from milkmen and breadmen and it was such a big like, People like that. And so I said to him, I worked for Mr. McCoy in the Woodstock Road as delivering meat. But every uh, Thursday, you had to go to the abattoir and uh, collect pork. And pork was very, very cheap. And pork ribs was for a delicacy. So I would go and get the basket of, of pork. And of course, I would see um, animals um, slaughtered. And uh, within within half an hour, Shane, that animal would be in bits and uh, skinned and dissected. It was amazing. And uh, they would throw eyes at you when you were first time there <laughs> to scare you, <laughs> you know? So I said, I can get you some eyes. <laughs> <there>. <laughs> so, so, anyway, he gave me the bus money, <laughs> and off I went, over the bridge, uh, into the abattoir, and uh, they gave me a plastic, which I think plastic was just being invented. It was really thick, and they gave me a bag. I didn't really want to do it, Ray. They gave me a bag, must have been about 10 in it, you know? So I'm on the bus coming back, the trolley bus. <laughs> And these eyes are in the butt, <laughs> and everybody's <laughs> looking at them, and people are moving away from me, you know, and stuff like that, and and, and children are laughing, you know, and I, I thought this is great, this is great, you yeah. know. 
And I got back at lunchtime and uh, everybody's in the playground, you know. And of course, I'm walking in with a big bag, it was about that size, of cow's eyes. <laughs> and they were, they were white all around, they, they got like gristle around it, and then the eye itself, you know, which is about that size, you know. So I'd throw one in among the girls, you know, when they were doing hopscotch or throwing balls up again. And this screams and the yells of them. And I said, I've landed. I didn't even know, but I had landed. At that moment, everybody was laughing and screaming. And I was the most famous boy in the school that day. Right. And the day before, I was the quietest boy yeah. in the school. All it took was a plastic bag full oh, of ice. Yeah, just because of one eye. Did that become a ca- like a, a, a feature going forward? Would well, you've ever shown up with it? Um, Mr. Um, Corbett, you called him, uh, he uh, put me in a play uh, where I was funny. I'd be a wizard and I'd do some magic and things like that. And, and uh, my show business career started. I I I was a bit of a, a, a raker, if you want to call it, in school, but the idea of stage performances or plays, secretly I'd, I'd have loved to have done things like that, but I just never would have had the confidence to to get up and do it. And I'm, I'm actually surprised I even tried stand-up for the first time. Do you remember the first time you not just did a play, but performed stand-up, as in performed jokes? or As if it was yesterday. I, I'm, I'm, may I ask when, when actually it was? Right. I was forced into it. Um, most of the comedians from the 70s were dance band singers. Right. Not a lot of people know that. Mm-hmm. And they were... Terrific vocalists. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, Mike Reed was like Tony Bennett. He was sensational. And he ran around with the Cray twins and people like that there in East London. And uh, and it's all talking like that and all that, you know, and and, and Cockney slang and all mm-hmm. that. It's all jokes. It's all yep. funny. It's all banter, yep. which Belfast is full of. Of I course, mean, yeah. So... <clears throat> I, uh, <coughs> Nori Sharp, uh, first of all, um, Danny Rice gave me a job. I was, I was 26 uh, in the Trocadero in the market in Cumming Street. And uh, I, think Dan, I think he was a joiner because he made a set of uh, Take Your Pick. Right, the, the boxes be there, and there'd be mo- a big prize in the box, and they would offer money. Michael Miles did it on the television, and I had never spoken to an audience before in my life. What age? What age were you then? I was a um, twenty-six. Right, I was a performer. Mm-hmm. Now I had been uh, uh, on stage quite a lot before that, but never. I always just sang to people, and um, now. Everybody used to say, why don't you tell a couple of jokes? Because you're very good at it. And I go, I'm, no, I'm quite happy singing. Right. I wanted to be a cool, Yeah. you know? I wanted yeah. to be a heartthrob. Type right. thing. When you're 26, you think you're the boy. I'm you? still trying to do that right. In the big picture, you know? <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyway, people would come up on the stage and they'd be funny. So I became funny with them. And uh, little did I know, I'm in training, mm-hmm. an apprenticeship yeah. for the future. Yeah. I never even guessed it. I wanted to get back to singing, you know. So that, yeah, and then I went to the talk of the town. It doubled the money and uh, doubled the prize money for the thing. There's 400 people there in the one room and it's packed out. You know? So people are almost playing like a live game show Type, yeah. type thing? Well, it was, oh, no, only one night a week they would okay. do it, you know, right. just as a sort of a gimmick to get people in, maybe on a Tuesday oh, okay. or a Wednesday or something, because Thursday, Friday and Saturday took care of themselves, you know. So uh, Nori was very, uh, Nori Sharp, they called him, him and his brother Jack owned the talk all the time, and they were very good to me, and uh, I would have lots of prizes and give them away and what have you, and free drinks and stuff like that. And, uh, and then uh, the troubles arrived. So uh, I'm off to England, and uh, I'm now a vocalist. And uh, everybody in England's a vocalist. Right. Everybody. Yeah. The bus man, the driver, <laughs> the train driver, they're all, they can all sing. Right. And every club I went to, the compere would go, and although I do say so myself, Shane, they weren't as good as me. Right. Yeah. But I'd missed the boat. Yeah. I'm the same age as Cliff. 
you know? Mm -hmm. So you need to hit it when you're young. Yeah. Uh, but I could do it. I could entertain, but you're down the pecking order. Yes. So you get very, very low wages. So the comp here at the club, he would be on a good screw, um, but he wouldn't be too happy about you taking the best numbers because you're only singing somebody else's talent, somebody who yes. wrote it and things like that. So anyway, uh, one of them said to me, could you not do a bit of comedy? You get more money, you know, if you do comedy vocals. <coughs> so you have a comedy vocal. That's what they put on your card. I said, oh, okay. <coughs> Is that sorry, songs with a little bit of jokes in between sort of thing? Yeah, do right. a little set. Okay. So I was very good at putting little sets together. And, uh, <coughs> pardon me. So uh, sometimes the musicians were not of the quality of Northern Ireland. Right. I mean, we're spoiled here. Mm -hmm. Over there, you'd have guys that said to me, a musician, were dreadful. And uh, you've still got to try and get through your set. So I filled it in with jokes yep. and um, one particular I was very lucky I got a council house in Peter Lee which was club land just below Sunderland and you could be anywhere in half an hour and you do two shows a night and the more you did the shows of course the better you got of course I try to tell comedians that they say how can I get better at comedy get on stage more get often get up yeah Yep. Oh, but there is not that many things. Do it for nothing. Yeah. Do it for nothing. Get on. Yeah. You can't. You can't become better unless you do it more often. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so um, I had this great opportunity. It took me five years to get to television standard. So, but in the meantime, comedy was changing. There was an underground current of modern comedians coming through, uh, and I was being left. In the dark. Was this in the 70s? Yeah. Right. I was being left in the dark. And then J Johnny Hamp invented the comedians, but he wouldn't let you on unless you told jokes. Right. So he did not want observational comedy. So, what oh, do you. Oh, so sorry, it had to be a defined, it had to be one liners as opposed to even stories. It had to be or a beginning, a middle, and an end. Right, okay. You know? So, uh, there was, there, you didn't have a choice. Right. So uh, <clears throat> I was working with the Crankies. Right. They live. They live next door. Right. <laughs> I lived in this cul-de-sac, <laughs> and we're all show business people <laughs> doing clubs. Dustin G, okay. Les Dennis, and Dustin G. Yeah, he's an impressionist. He was yeah. a fabulous guy. Uh, who else was there? They're all comedians all around. There's one called. Harry James, who changed his name to Mickey Gunn, and uh, he he was very funny and very generous with with jokes. If it didn't suit him, he'd say, "Do you want this one or something?" You know. So um, Tony Blair, the uh, p politician, yeah. uh, among other names they call him, <laughs> um, he was uh, the MP for Trimden Colliery. I was surrounded by Easington, Horden. <sighs> trimmed in all collieries and these men needed their spirits lifting right they needed laughter yeah. right yeah and uh steel workers down in middlesbrough and stockton and places like that would you have uh, said sorry it was similar to belfast in that way like exactly like a, exactly an industry <coughs> industrial or? worker men's yeah um of environment and uh they weren't they weren't uh university educated or anything mm -hmm. like that they were hard-working people yeah uh, so they wanted their their comedy not as sort of as the way it is today yeah um so they wanted um jokes and uh, i went to trimden and it was horrible it was awful trimden Trimden ex service men's club, they call it. They'd have ex service, but none of them had been in the army. They'd have labor club, nobody would labor. Right. Ex conservative club, you know, <laughs> Catholic club, there's no Catholic. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. It was just a title. You, had, you couldn't have the same club twice. Oh, okay, right. right. So um, the crankies are on. They were a big club act. So I, I play golf with uh, the, the, the boy out of the crankies. And. Uh, 
he said, oh, I've heard you're a great singer and all that. You know, I said, yeah, I'm trying to be a comedian, Ian, you call him. And he said, all oh, right, we do comedy as well, you know. So I said, OK, so I'll go along to this club. And I was so polite coming from Belfast because the troubles were on and you had a you had tongue in cheek type of thing. You'd have to be cap in hand type of thing. And I would have three copies of music, a piano copy, a really well laid out with a melody line copy and uh, and one without the melody line, which was four, as we used to call them in Belfast, heads. Right. Somebody who knew what he was doing. So I said, do you both read? I was so polite. Yeah. And nine times out of ten, the drummer would say, no, I don't, but he does. Mm. I went, right. but it was just the way I said it rather than, do you read? Right. Yeah. It's like it's insulting, <laughs> yeah. offensive when you say that. Do you both read? So. <laughs> <coughs> and he took the most difficult parts and he couldn't play. Right. He couldn't play. It was, it was frightening what was going on. And... Um, I finished up singing The Forty Shades of Green. I would go over to him, do you know The Forty Shades of Green? I'll take you home again, Kathleen. I was saying, finish up songs that he might know, and he did. <coughs> and got away with, got away with the first uh, 20 minutes. You had to do 20 minutes. So uh, he made a fool of me. And uh, before I went, I said, thank you for your understanding, ladies and gentlemen. I think I've given the wrong parts. Um, to the organist of mine, it's not his fault, mine, it was my fault. But uh, have you heard this? And I told them a joke and they laughed, okay? They came off and uh, he was uh, a bit angry in the mm -hmm. dressing room, you know? So um, he said something offensive to me. He said he couldn't read the Irish music. Right. I said, there's no such thing as Irish music. It's music, yep. it's worldwide. Everyone in the world can read it except you. Yeah. And he took a swing at me. Now, I'd done a bit of boxing before, what well, have you. Know, yeah. so I missed his swing, you know what I mean, and connected yeah. one with him. Yeah. And he fell, he was underneath the sink. <laughs> and every time he tried to get up, he hit his head on the, <laughs> on the U bend. And it was, it was like comedy, you know. And Ian and Jeanette were in, they were getting changed. She's standing there in her knickers, she's like three foot high, you know. <clears throat> and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the concert time was going in. Hey, you've got to get out of this club, and uh, you know we can't have this sort of behaviour. I said I never did. And he took a swing at me, yeah. and the cranky said, "Yeah, he did. Yeah." So he said, "Roy never hit him," you know. So anyway, um, he said, "I'll give you half your money and then clear off. I don't want any trouble," you know. And I said, "I desperately need this money, sir." I said, "It was fifteen quid for the night. Mm -hmm. I desperately need. I have a wife and three children." I said, and um, I need the money. Could I please go on again and I won't use the band? He said, what will you do? I said, I'll do some comedy. And he says, well, if it doesn't work, you're not getting any more money. I said, okay. So I went on and I paralyzed him. Because it, the whole thing about his head hitting the yeah. U had gone round. And they're, they're working blokes, you know what I mean? <laughs> they thought it was hilarious. So you just retold that story? Yeah. yeah. So... <laughs> <coughs> I couldn't wait to get to work the next night. And the next night, the band said to me, do you need us? And for the first time in my life, she and I said, no. And that was that was the moment where it was jokes? It was I was, comedy. became a comedian. Because you had to? You needed, you needed to go you back to. up on stage and you get your money? You have to. You have to. You say about, you know, you did a bit of boxing those days. I saw footage of you doing like a hammer throw. Yeah. On a documentary I watched? Yeah. You look like a Love Island contestant nowadays. Really? I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. I've never seen anything like well, it. Well, I was in the army at the time. We, yeah. we had through the hammer. I We didn't have guns in them days, you know. Just you throwing a, it was just you throwing just, a hammer? I just threw the hammer. <laughs> yeah. It was quite accurate. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I want to go back a wee bit to the likes of... You say about the tr Trocadero? Trocadero? Yeah, the Trocadero in Comic Street. So I, I, I can't fathom... I know what comedy clubs look like nowadays... But I can't imagine in the 70s or 60s, even in, in Belfast, if you went into a venue like that and there was a show on, how different was it to now? How different were audiences? Like, was it, were people dressed in, in, in more, like, even audience members, were, were they done up more? Was it more of a, an occasion? Was going out more of a, a thing? And 
was it because in my mind it's all these red velvet curtains and just a bit more glamour and showbiz. I I, I just love to have known what it's because these buildings aren't aren't there anymore. You're making history asking a question like that. How Shane, so? it was the first time women were allowed into pubs. Really? So there was glamour. Right. There's no woman going to go out with their man yeah. without a lovely outfit. Mm-hmm. They so couldn't get over it. They, were, they didn't even know what to ask for right. in the pub. <laughs> what sort of a drink they should have. Yeah. I mean, gin and orange right. was number one. Okay. They, they hadn't got into it. Yeah. It was the beginning of something really glamorous. Mm -hmm. And guys would be well dressed. Yeah. I mean the, the the bar would be lined up with car salesmen dressed to kill, you know, whoever whoever they'd kill during the day for <laughs> selling them some wreck. <laughs> <coughs> they were throwing money around them as if there was no tomorrow. And that was the beginning. Mm-hmm. The first cabaret, there was a club called the Club Orchid, the Johnny Johnson. Uh, he was in that. It was more of a members thing, that. But everybody was well-dressed in that, and they did a bit of dancing and what have you. But the talk of the town and the truck of there, there was no dancing. And then um, it was just um, a cabaret environment. Yeah. I just, I would love to have seen, I, 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 it's obviously impossible. I would love to know what it would be like to do a set back then now you know I'd, I'd just love to know how different audiences were and let me ask you about mm -hmm. e even heckling you know you get heckled you know you someone shouts shouts something out obviously I don't think I think that was 10 years ago maybe that was done a little bit more I think audiences are at the minute re really good with that kind of thing but when you were on stage telling jokes back then are the audience joining in or were they were they well behaved or did it depend what you were well um when, when you go into a venue now, a lot of the comedians you're working with are the same as you. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if, I, I didn't know it at the time, but I'm, I, I wouldn't say that I was a great comedian, but I would say I have a very different style, uh, which the audience quite like the delivery of it. Yes, yeah. Um, so, heckle... I got very rarely heckled, but uh, I've been booed off. Yeah? You know. Um, Do you um, remember the first time that happened? Oh, quite often. <laughs> I mean, J J Jimmy Cricket, he used to come into our house. He had no money to go home. Right. I mean, he's got to come here and there's more and all that. You know, yeah, he'd oh, yeah. He'd into my little council house and we'd feed him and give him some money for petrol. Right. And away we'd go back to Rochdale. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, yeah, you got... They were very, very hard. Uh, they... The first job I did uh, was it was it was like the talk of the town. There was a fellow called Eddie Buchanan. He had a nightclub. He was comparing a nightclub in Rotherham called the Windmill Club. And uh, when the trouble started, um, there was a curfew here and there was no work. So um, I phoned him up and he said, "Oh, I'll give you a week's work." And um, I said, "Okay." He said, "I'll try and get you some workies." Uh, during early on in the night. You won't be on till 11 o'clock at night. And um, so I went over and uh, did a tryout f for him. And um, uh, people would pay you off. Uh, at the, the, in the work is you had to do two 20-minute spots. So after one 20-minute spot, they would just say, I'm sorry, son, you haven't got it, or get the hell out of here. Oh, so your second spot wasn't guaranteed? No. So for a lot of the first year I lived there, I was I had to wait by the phone for the phone to ring for me to go and replace some other comedian. Right. But that sounds good because you got seven and a half quid, but nobody listened to you. Right. But didn't because matter. you weren't who they thought. All you had to do was to stay the twenty minutes. Mm -hmm. So you learn the tolerance of that. Yeah. Right. It's like having to stitch when you're running. Yeah. You know, the pain is there, but you've got to do it. Plant your feet. You've got to get to the finishing yeah. line to get yeah. the money. Mm -hmm. And you learn more from that because yeah. uh, after a while, I thought it was really funny, Shane. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. dying. Yeah. Nobody listening to you. People say, get off, get yeah. back to Ireland, you know. Yeah. Especially if, I, I, in a weird way, I enjoy that too, especially if, if you're on with someone you know and it happens to them too. Because you can, you know, you can, 
you can laugh in the in the misery of it. I want to ask you about. <coughs> there's so much. <coughs> let me, let me get it. Yeah, you work away. Um, I want to ask you about. So it seems to me that you you had done some stuff here. You you went over to England and then you started to 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 be a comedian there. Um, but when you when you left here, that I'm, I'm right in saying that was because of the troubles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we let we um, well, there was no work for a start. And uh, I'd made quite a, a, a name for myself, if I should say so, in, in Belfast. So I'd achieved what I had to, to achieve, and I couldn't see any any future. There was nowhere to work. Mm-hmm. So uh, that was one reason. The other reason was is that we were a mixed uh, marriage, I'm on Abby, uh, which is... Uh, been reading Billy Connolly's book I'm on having he talks about it because his family's like intertwined, intertwined uh, with uh, Catholics and Protestants and what have you and uh, <coughs> um, we we uh, were at the talk of the town so I was living in Carrick and uh, I came up from Carrick bought a house in, in the Ravenhill Road and opened a shop on the Woodstock Road you know and I was happy as Larry happy and met the woman of my dreams, and I had three beautiful children, and uh, I thought, you know, we Belfast, we have this work ethic. Mm-hmm. It's it's terrific, and I had it, and uh, I enjoyed every second of it. You know, being in the talk of the town, everybody clapping you and laughing and carrying on and what have you, and serving fruit during the day, getting up, being at the market at five o'clock in the morning, gathering fruit. So that's in George's? Is that where? Pardon? It was just in George's market? Yeah. So you would sell sell fruit and veg during the day? Yeah. And then do your your shows at night? Yeah. I also drove a van during the day for a butcher up in the Ardoin. Mm -hmm. Uh, So uh, Frank Sullivan, who was a a bouncer at the Trocadera, him and I became friends and he said, my wife said to me, show business is very fickle, Roy. What? I said, I'll get a job, don't worry. So I got a job driving a van for Mr. Hastings. He owns all the hotels. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Right, so um, so I'm, I'm landed. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got good money coming in. Presumably you were also selling eyes on the side. Yeah. Just as a side project. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I, uh, I moved up into Belfast, and uh, unfortunately it was into... Uh, 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 you know, a unionist area and what have you, and then uh, so they found out that uh, my wife was wasn't the same religion and what have you. So uh, the troubles were very severe at that time. You know, did did, did you have kids at this point? You have three kids, yeah, they, in the house. So, and so what? Well, uh, so I had no gigs or anything. You know, so one of the customers at the talk of the town gave me a job. Derek was his name for ent- enterprise taxis. So mm-hmm. I became a taxi driver, but taking people around troubled areas and things like that there. Mm-hmm. So people were very kind, you know, and I was very well known and I could go to troubled areas and the barrier barricades and people would let me in with customers and things like that. So anyway, I got one gig uh, up in, up the top of the the St. Fay Road. I forget the name of the bar. And uh, we called into this little shop behind Rotsdale Street and the woman said, oh, you're well-dressed, where are you going? I said, Tina, we are having that a night out. I've got a gig and told her where it was and what have you. And uh, the mother-in-law's looking after the kids. So, the, uh, the thank God we told her that. So we went and, and um, I, I can ring you and to give you the name of the venue. I've got it at home. So we went and did the gig and what have you. And the phone rang and um, the barman says, for you, Roy. I went, how could it be for me? <laughs> Who would know I was here? It was the wee woman. There's men outside in the van. They're pouring petrol over, over your house and what have you, you know? So oh, we rushed down and she phoned the police and uh, nothing happened. Or I had lost all the three kids and the mother-in-law, you know? So anyway, that I put them into the car and I drove to the, to the mother-in-law's house with them that night. Drove back into town back into Belfast the next day and uh, phoned phoned a solicitor to sell the house and what have you and the furniture and all that and that afternoon I went to Larne and caught the ferry and never came back 
but everybody was going through that. I mean, people were going through worse. They were being taken out and jumping out of windows. They were being shot. Mm -hmm. You know, round where I lived, it was frightening. A number of people lost their life. It's um, it, it, it's amazing that you still have such a love clearly for Belfast after that. You know, because you could easily have borne such a resentment that you wouldn't want to come back and perform here and. Yeah, it's like, well, I think, <coughs> I don't think I should take an accolade for that. As I, I'm a Belfast boy. Uh, it's in here, it's not. Mm -hmm. um, everybody who ever helped me in my career, everybody, is Catholics because they they run show business. Right. You know? And they would give you a job, they wouldn't ask you, and they would know your name. Mm -hmm. They would know by your name that you weren't a Catholic, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so... Um, I, I never had any any um, argument or any hadn't I was without um, I'm not a bigot or a no, racist or anything like that you know lucky I don't have those yep. at the time you know in my body. Did you have a, a a big sadness at leaving here or did you have to just <coughs> almost roll with it and starting you know was when you when you go to England you know to to start a new life there. Especially with three kids, I mean that's such a huge change. Um, were were you quite confident that you could go there and and start a new life? Did you plan to come back or? Um, well, I wanted to be successful. I always thought I would be. I believed in me, and Jean believed in me, which is more important. And uh, I mean. We, I entered talent competitions in England in Butlins and got to the final and all that. So I knew I had something. I just yeah. had to keep working at it. And, yeah. Uh, and, but I, I had this strong belief. I, I will I'll do something. I will be something in this business. Yeah. You know? Uh, so uh, with, with that in mind, I went in, into the hardest school possible. The same school you go into. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, mm -hmm. everywhere you... Um, somebody asked me the other day, um, who's your favourite comedian? I used to tell them, do you know what I say now? Anybody who does it. Yeah. It's so hard. I thought you were going to say me for a second, Roy. I'll be honest. That was, my, <laughs> yeah, that was the second part of this question, <laughs> yeah. but you just jumped in there. You're in the top 15. I'll take that. <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway... Uh, I got away, and uh, some people describe you as a half full or half empty, you know, I've always been half full, and um, if somebody up there likes me, I worked hard again, and um, had this beautiful uh, wife and three kids, and and we 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 left our beloved Belfast and Joanna, my daughter. Um, she was born in Tantmore Avenue, and what have you. She's a big West End star, and I and what have you in the movies with Kenneth Branagh, Belfast, and all that. You know, Amazing. so everything is there for a reason, I think. Yeah, yeah. But I had no bit bitterness. As soon as I got success, seventy seven, um, the first gig I came back to. Uh, it was a pub, and I'm sure some of the boys that were in that van that night with the petrol were in the audience, and they were coming up and apologising. Yeah, you know, somebody sent them, and what yeah. have you. Yeah, and they were glad I'd done well. You know, so mm -hmm. that's that's another side of Belfast. You know, um, the thing that I and there is no way I'm going to get through everything that I want to talk to you about because I could. I could listen to you for days on end, but I want to ask about about the likes of new faces and and catchphrase and and all that. I remember hearing an interview with Bradley Walsh where he was talking about how he got the chase, about how it was very much fluke, and he he just was in the right place at the right time. Catchphrase I grew up with. I remember it was always on my granny's house, always on, um, and I just remember. I remember being so amazed that that man's from here. You know, that, that yeah. I don't remember that many voices on television at the time. 
no. of, of people that were from here. Well, it was Gloria and yeah. Frank. Yeah. You yeah. know, and and Eamon. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're the, and Ivor Mills. He was a newsreader. Okay. And Anne Gregg. Right. They were from Ulster Television. Um, so. How, how, how did you land that gig, catchphrase? Well, it was... Um, it was dead strange uh, how how I got it. Um, I started to open for singers, big singers, mm-hmm. you know, twenty thousand people, and uh, I opened the Apollo in uh, where Starlight Express was with Shirley Bassey, and uh, she told Tom Jones about me, and uh, his management rather, and uh, I did ten tours with her. And then Tom had been in Las Vegas for years and he hadn't been back for 10 years. So I got, um, I was doing a gig with Bobby Davro and Jim Davison at the Apollo in Coventry. And um, Jim Davison had too much to drink on the opening night and forgot his keys to the house he'd rented, dropped a brick on his foot and cut his big toe off nearly. <laughs> So he couldn't do the show, so they cancelled the show. And a man called Barry Clayman, who brought Tom Jones over, um, he, he got in touch with my management. <coughs> and he said, we can't pay him with all the money, and uh, but we'll give him a percentage of the... And I said, no, I don't want any money. I'm glad to have the time off. Mm-hmm. Because the manager I had, he worked you to death. Right. So I had two weeks off. And uh, no one ever refused money from Barry Clayman before, mm-hmm. right? So he had heard of me from Shirley Bassey, and uh, he said, I'm giving him the Tom Jones tour. Now, in those days, Shane, you had to pay to be on with people like that. Yeah. To get the exposure. Yeah. So I got 14 shows at the Albert Hall. I'm the only comedian ever to do it, right? 13,000 people a night. And uh, it, was, it was tremendous. Yeah. So Gordon Mills flies in from America because I've done Cornwall, I've done Scotland, I've done the Northeast, I've done everywhere. And I d- did well in the tour because it's a fabulous audience. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, How long um, of a set would you do when you're when you're One open? hour. You're opening well, He only did 50 minutes. Tom Jones? Yeah, he got four million, I got 400. <laughs> <laughs> he stitched you up there. He's unbelievable. Mr. You would, Sir Tom Jones, he's a beautiful fellow. So You would do an hour, really? Yeah, one hour. I yeah. thought you were going to tell 20, me 20. 20 minute in, uh, interval and then him. Um, so it was the same with Miss Bassey. She can only do 45 minutes. Right. So anyway, Gordon Mills flies over and he, uh, he sends for me into the bar in uh, Albert Hall. And um, I've got to tell you a story about the Belfast couple outside. Don't don't let me go without that one, okay? So um, anyway, he said, uh, is there anywhere you, he's he's from Wales. And he invented Tom Jones. Right. Tommy Woodward is Tom Jones' name. Jerry Dorsey, he invented into Engelbert Humperdinck. Gilbert O'Sullivan. He invented all them. Right. And managed them all. Mm -hmm. He was a genius. He was a harmonica player in a band. Right. So uh, he flew in and he, and he said to me, uh, I want you to open in Atlantic City in three weeks' time, you know? And I said, OK, I'll have to phone the office. What office, he said? My manager. He said, I don't speak to managers. Right. I said, well, I do. <laughs> yeah. He said, no, no. He said, you want to go to Atlantic City? You do it through me. I said, hold on a wee minute, Mr. Miller. I said, you want me to betray the man that got me the gig? here to go with you and he went well now that you put it that way I said what sort of a person would I be yeah so he went oh okay well but they have loads of comedians over yeah. there yeah so I didn't go so word got back to my cues and now I'm going nowhere I'm just supporting singers you know right. I haven't got catchphrases or anything like that there so Somebody up there likes me, I told you. Russ Abbott takes me, but he's now left the Black Abbots, who are powerful, powerful show band, like Club Sound and mm-hmm. the, the Witnesses and people you know, from Nolan. Everybody copied the Witnesses, you know. Right. 
so he takes me for summer season with Dama, and we open up the Bournemouth International Centre. 3,000 people every night, sold out before we open. And uh, I'm in the second half of the show, and Russ is just doing sketches now. He's very funny looking. He looks like Leonard Rossett or John Clay's right. Bruce Forsyth. He looks like all of them, you know? He's a funny looking man. But the only joke he has is about a fat, ugly woman, Bella. Poor old Bella got it in the neck every night, you know. Right. Well, half a, halfway through that, the audience are fed up with it, you know. So mm-hmm. I come on the second half, one liner, one liner, one liner, one liner. I've only got ten minutes. Yeah. Steal the show. Yeah. Everybody from TV's in. Right. To sign him up. Uh huh. So, my manager is a very quiet fellow. My cues, you call him, from Liverpool. John K. Cooper is the head of ITV. He goes. Oh, it's good to see Roy tonight. He said, yeah, Mike said, yeah. He said, did really well, didn't he? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, uh, it's a pity we don't see him more often on TV. And Mike said, well, why, why don't you give him a go at one of those game shows? Now, Graham C. Williams, who became my producer of Catchphrase, he bought Spitting Image, Blockbusters and Catchphrase in a jumble sale in America. Okay. Every one of them is a giant over here. Yeah, of course. So he said, Game show, Roy Walker. Are you kidding? <laughs> it's too slow. It's too quiet. <laughs> and Mike said the magic words. Think of the money he'll save you. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I still don't think it'll work, but send, send, them, send them to the studio. The set's still there. So I drive the whole way to Maidstone through London, the centre of London, after the show that night. Yeah. And wake up the next morning at 8 o'clock. I've got to get back to Bournemouth through the centre of London. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've nobody to play with except these two old cleaning ladies in the toilets, in the gents' toilets. So I drag the two of them out, give them a fiver each, <laughs> and they're on, the sh- they're on the set and what have you. And they don't know what they're looking at. And the catchphrase on the set is, it's a bird and a bush mm-hmm. and there's two pigeons in the bush and one in the hand okay two in the two in the hand is better than one in the bush good but not right <laughs> oh, no. a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush aye that's the expression we're looking for is that not what I said no I no don't, oh, all right. no you didn't Sorry. you put it back to front <laughs> but uh, anyway um they, they didn't know what to say and they were dying to get back to their job in case they got the sack you know so somebody up there likes me so I said girls just say what you see and the producers back there said what did he say Yeah. and nobody knew nobody was interested and he twined a tape back he wound a tape back say what you see he said that's what the game's about give him the job brilliant so I got the job and then do you have to drive back then and do the do the gig to do the gig so I get back they haven't told me they still have to have a meeting about it okay so I get back and uh, the message from the doorkeeper is somebody said the job's yours so you get told that on your way back into the show yeah so I was like over the moon so back to the Albert Hall tell me about the Belfast couple so I'm coming out of the Albert Hall and Tom Jones fans (laughs) everywhere you know what I mean Mm -hmm. uh and uh, I'm walking, trying to get through them and what have you. And uh, the Belfast voice said, Hey, Roy, talk of the town, <laughs> sticking out, great show tonight, you know? I said, Oh, thanks. You used to go to the talk of the town? Yeah, we used to go to the talk of the town. Now, when I was at the talk of the town, Shane, we sang the hit parade. I was more famous for singing. Delilah than Tom Jones. Right. <laughs> I was more famous for singing Release Me than Engelbert. Right? right? Yeah. Well, they, they were never going to come here. There was nowhere for them to, wa- to work. Not like now. Yeah. It's fantastic here, you know. We've yeah. got so many venues. So I said, uh, you enjoyed the show? He said, oh, it was sticking out, sticking out. Right, it really was, you know. And uh, I said to her, did you enjoy it? And she went, no. <laughs> I went, why not? She said, he sung all your songs. <laughs> it's crazy, crazy. 
I mean, it's crazy to think that, like you say, there was there was no venues. No. And now you must look at Belfast and see the the arena and the waterfront. It's something on every world. night. It's fantastic. Uh, that's very funny. <laughs> So that's how that's how I I, I, got, I got catchphrase, and um, I did that for like fourteen years. I think I did that for, and we never dropped below ten million. So every, lots of people know me. Yeah, yeah. But then you, I I was insisted in doing a joke at the top. Yes. But comedy was changing so much. The modern comedian was coming through. Yeah. You know, I'd like to talk a wee bit more about Edinburgh and what it did for me, mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. you wouldn't mind. Of course, um, yeah. It was like going back to, to school. It was like a university of, and the city and all the cities. It's a fantastic city, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and for, I mean, for people who don't know about the Edinburgh Fringe, you're there for usually 28 days, 28 nights. Yeah. And you're doing a show every night. Yeah. An, an, an hour-long show. Mm. And Mark, uh, my eldest boy, and Philip said to me, oh, Daddy, don't tell no jokes up there. They don't like jokes. Don't tell jokes. For goodness sake, don't tell jokes. And I went, but that's what I do. Yeah. I tell jokes. Yeah. You know? Uh, I'm not completely old-fashioned. They do have modern subjects to talk about and what have you. Uh, so, uh, anyway. I finished my first show. I am cock a hoop. I'm sitting and just in between two pieces of canvas, mm -hmm. about six foot across, and uh, I'm sitting there. I'm just thinking, oh, I, I could could have cried. It was yep. so successful that night, you know. And the phone rang, and it was uh, the 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 promoter who put me on. He went, "Where are you?" I said, uh, "I'm still in the dressing room. Get up here." He said, "You're on the show. What show's that?" Uh, the the um, what do you call it? The assembly rooms. Yes. Um, with the, the Dublin comedian, um, Jason Byrne. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's packed out. He's sensational. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but I didn't know that. Our Mark had said to him, "Look after my dad." You know. Yeah. So anyway, I get up there, and uh, lots of people are going on to sort of way. Yep. TV's there, the press are there, everybody's there to plug the show. Okay, yeah, yeah. Right, and this this guy, I'd never seen anything like Jason Byrne before. Yeah. He was like the modern day, rude, uh, Bruce Forsyth, Michael Bymore rolled into one. You yep. know, he just controlled the whole crowd. He's sensational. Yeah. So he puts this guy on, this guy wouldn't come off. And he was getting worse and worse and worse. He's someone who'd been in America. He'd, he'd been here and then he'd gone to America and thought he was something and come back with it and it didn't happen. Yeah. So Jason's come out, come out, come off to me and he said, I'm going to introduce you after this guy here. Michael Bymore standing over there, you know what I mean? It's, it's a big trick, you know. Yeah. So I, he's doing a play or something. Right. So uh, Jason goes on and it gives me this fabulous introduction. And Shane, I go on, and the applause must have lasted five minutes. Yeah. I couldn't get started. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? So, I don't know. You say some silly things, you know, you wish you hadn't said, you know. To, anyway, uh, after this applause, they all sort of said, I said, I said uh, do, do you remember me? Or something like that, right. you know what I mean? Which made them <laughs> laugh. Uh, yeah. And I went mean, into a wee quick routine in what have you, where I got to um, the full path and the roof goes off and young people love that they've mm -hmm. never seen that yep. you know and I went I'm at the ballroom you know I'm here for three weeks if you want to come down you know I'd love to see you and went off and they went crazy and the whole press followed me into the bar mm -hmm. and I said something to them they never heard before and they said what did, what did you come off for why didn't you stay on you only did about six minutes and I went but I can't make them laugh louder than that yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and they quoted me on that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And they said nobody could. And was that a. Did that mean so much to you, that run and the success of that run? Because. Acceptability. Being accepted. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then it just got even better because yeah. um, word flew round, flew round, flew round. Press came out the next day. And then I went up to the library bar. Yep. And Andrew was there, Andrew Maxwell. Mm -hmm. And he went, Roy, you're here. And all the heads are there. Yeah. So I was like in, immediately in with the in crowd. Yeah. And Jim Jeffries is there. Yeah, of course. And yeah. Jim Jeffries says, I like you. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
do you like football? I went, yeah. yeah. He said, we'll go together. Right. So it was like classroom mates yeah. at, at university. Yes. Except yeah. like I was three times their age. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at the time of my life, like, I can understand how much that would that 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 would mean. I couldn't go back. Right. I, I couldn't possibly. I couldn't repeat that. Yeah. Would you? Again, there's. I know you've got to literally get back on the, a cruise ship, but I, I want to ask you one more, a couple more things, which are, um, what do you still want to do? Because you've played every any venue I could mention or think of. You've played it, and with superstars and and that kind of thing. But is there maybe a project or a venue or a thing that you would you would still really like to do? Maybe some what one you never got to tick off. Um, it's a good question, I, 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 I can't think of anything that I'd like to do. It just um, I'm amazed at how long it's gone on for and and is going on for. Um, I, I'm a true uh, working comedian. That's yep. really all I am. Um, I wouldn't say I was a star comedian. I'm quite a well-known comedian, and uh, I'm a one-off uh, in in style and what I would assume as not the same as, but in looking at Billy Connolly, he was only, there'll never be anything quite like him. Yep. He's probably the greatest storyteller of all time yep. uh, on stage I've ever seen. Uh, Chick Murray was, to me, mm -hmm. a storyteller. I am a storyteller. Yep. Uh, you don't necessarily have to be the pub landlord. You don't necessarily have to be Lee Mack. You don't have to be Ricky Gervais, although they're all brilliant, yep. you know. Yep. But they're all different. And yep. that, that if anybody's watching this uh, wants to become a comedian, be different. Yeah, that's the way. Let me ask you two quick things. One is, so I've, like yourself, when, whenever you were, you know, making it, whenever you were performing, you know, I've got a young family. I'm tr I'm on the road. I'm performing and that kind of thing. What's What's a little bit of advice you would give me on that? As 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 not just a comedian, but being a father, having a family, and and doing comedy. Well, your fatherhood is different from mine. Yeah. We, uh, of my age group, we were providers, which meant you didn't see much of your kids, like fellas that worked in the shipyard and worked in the rope works and worked in different places. Um, they they saw very little of their family. They just put bread on the table and clothes on their back. Um, as far as the only advice I gave to my kids was, don't be late. That's all they remember. Mm -hmm. Is did you have Mark Walker? Was he any good? Yeah, he was late. Right. They remember that. Don't be too disappointed if you do badly, and too elated if you do well. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as uh, being a father is concerned, being a brilliant father, I think only happens in the movies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your favorite them. Um one liner, whether it's yours or someone else's, but if you were telling one joke, if you were in front of the Apollo. Uh, if I was telling one joke, um, I was uh, with um, Josh Widdicombe and um, mm -hmm. the Asian, uh, they're doing a bit of a double act together. Yeah, uh, Ramesh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ramesh, Lo lovely people. Yeah, and uh, we were talking about difference between comedy, you know, and uh, he said, "What's the difference, Roy, between your comedy and today's comedy?" I said, "Education." I said, "You've got a better vocabulary than us, and um, we are all working class, uh, and uh, we 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 all, most of us left school at fourteen. And you, most of you have been to university. And uh, he said, uh, "Were you were you a dropout, Roy?" And I said, "No, I, I think I was cesarean." <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
Lovely, lovely way to end, Roy. Um, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm so glad that you've come on this podcast. It means honestly so much. Um, I was describing it to Michael earlier before you came in. It, it, it's surreal to have, you know, seen you growing up, seen you do stand up, re- talk about you doing stand up in the seventies, and here we are in 2022, yeah, having a conversation, and you're gigging and you're performing and. Uh, Honestly, it, mean, it means so much to me. Thank, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. It means a lot to me as well. as can offer you. would ask me for advice uh, about fatherhood. And I just thought of a thing is for you to think positive all the time mm-hmm. and test negative, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Roy, thank you so much for having tea with me. I really appreciate it. Thank, <laughs> thank you so you, much. Shane. Thank you. Thank you.